In the previous video, we discussed the dangers of entertainment and how it has completely taken over our lives. The video aimed to remind us that constantly entertaining ourselves wastes our precious time and prevents us from living life to the fullest. However, we didn't answer a crucial question, which is why do we even entertain ourselves? Why is it that human beings since the first civilization have the need and the urge to divert their attention? Is it a way to escape from existential questions? Does our subconscious need to be occupied? What is it exactly? To answer these questions, we will examine the philosophy of Blaise Pascal, who had written about this topic and perfectly explained it. Blaise Pascal, born in 1623 in Clermont-Ferrand, was a French mathematician, physicist and philosopher. Initially, Pascal was writing a book called Defense of the Christian Religion or Apologie de la Religion Chrétienne in French, but he died before finishing it. All the notes of this book were gathered after his death and published posthumously as the Pensée or Thoughts of Pascal. This book is Pascal's most influential theological work and is widely considered a masterpiece and a landmark in French philosophy. I recommend reading it because despite containing random fragments of text, Pascal's writing style and construction of ideas are truly remarkable. Some passages alone make it a must read. In this book, Pascal says, I've discovered that all the misfortunes of men arise from one thing only, that they are unable to stay quietly in their own chamber. This will be our starting point to truly understand the concept of diversion. First, let's try to understand what he meant by staying quietly in a chamber. Is it a state of physical stillness or an absence of thought? As dual beings, we have both a body and a mind. Let's say a physical entity and a spiritual entity. They're both parts of a whole and this whole is in constant movement. The world in which we live in is characterized by perpetual motion and transformation. It is never still. Therefore, as a part of this world, there is no reason we should be an exception to this law. If you try to sit quietly in a room, you realize that even though you can force your body to be still, your mind will always wander. It's very difficult to keep your mind focused on one thing or even not focus on anything at all, to keep your mind completely empty. And for those who meditate, you definitely know what I'm talking about because when you sit down and you start your meditation session, you will realize that in the first one or two minutes, it's very difficult to just keep your thoughts aligned with your body and just empty your mind. It's very difficult because as soon as you do it, as soon as you empty your mind, next thing you know, you're already thinking about something else. And every time your mind does that, you have to bring it back to just thinking about your breath or something. So you need to always keep um, directing it and managing it in order for it not to divert. So our mind always have this tendency to think about something, to occupy itself, to divert itself. And this is exactly what Pascal was talking about. And there is also another situation when this happens. Is for example, if we're doing a repetitive task that doesn't that doesn't require our mental faculties, your mind will always wander. If when I'm washing the dishes, I'm never thinking about the dishes. I'm always thinking about something else because it's an automatic movement. I don't need my mind when I'm doing that. Whereas when I'm doing a sales call, when I'm writing a YouTube. Uh, a video script, for example, then I'm completely consumed. My mind and my body are aligned. They're doing the same thing because what I'm doing, the task at hand requires my mental faculties. So this is what he meant when, when he said not being able to stay quietly in a room because as soon as you sit down, your mind will always want to occupy itself. This difficulty in controlling our thoughts and the constant need to reflect on something is what Pascal referred to as not knowing how to sit quietly in the room. We struggle to remain at rest because as soon as our body isn't busy, our mind demands activity. This is why philosophies like Stoicism and Buddhism are relevant for many people. They address this restlessness and our inability to remain still. Our human condition is marked by anxiety and a lack of serenity. But why is that? But upon stricter examination, when having found the cause of all our ills, I have sought to discover the reason of it. I have found one which is paramount, the natural evil of our weak and mortal condition, so miserable that nothing can console us when we think of it attentively. What separates us from other living beings is our consciousness and our ability to ask metaphysical questions about life and death. Death in particular is something our minds struggle to tolerate or comprehend. The idea
idea of death is absurd to us. The notion that everything will eventually cease to exist, that the world as we know it will end and that we will perish with it. This is a challenging concept to grasp and the reason of all our ills. This is what the German philosopher Martin Heidegger calls existence. Precisely, he uses the term Dasein to describe human existence. To exist is to be aware of one's mortality. Dasein is unique because it's aware of its own existence and can reflect on it. This self-awareness includes an understanding of its own mortality. According to Heidegger, it is the encounter with death that most profoundly highlights the question of being. He says, only humanity has the distinction of standing and facing death, because the human being is earnest about being. Death is the supreme testimony to being. Heidegger's concept of being toward death describes the attitude we should adopt toward our mortality. This involves recognizing death as an inevitable and defining aspect of existence. Rather than being a morbid preoccupation, it is a way to live more fully and meaningfully. However, things are a bit more complicated than that. Not everyone has the mental capacity to rationalize death and use it as a driving force. When we recognize our finite nature, it can either lead to a more authentic and intentional existence or to a constant fixation that will make us unhappy and trigger our anxiety. Regardless of how you view death, we can all agree that it's an absurd idea that can cause anxiety if you think about it for too long. Because our minds cannot fully comprehend the concept of death and we always have questions about it, how it feels like and what comes after, just to name a few. And since we don't have satisfying or reassuring answers, we try to avoid thinking about it altogether. And this is precisely why Pascal said that we divert our attention and want to occupy our minds. Because boredom and silence create the perfect environment to start asking ourselves existential questions and thinking about our mortality. And this is exactly what we want to avoid. In his book, Pascal uses the French word divertissement, which translate to diversions in English. The term diversion comes from the Latin root diversio, derived from the verb divertiri, meaning to turn aside or to turn in different directions. When we occupy our minds, we divert our attention from our mortality, allowing us to bypass the anxiety that it causes. You can view this as a coping mechanism. When confronted with something that makes us anxious and uncomfortable, we shift our focus to something else. In the previous video, we focus on entertainment, which is just one aspect of diversion. This aspect is related to leisure activities, but for Pascal, diversion encompasses much more than that. It refers to any activity that distracts us from thinking about our mortality and the human condition. To make life bearable, we occupy our minds with distractions. We provide material to our minds to avoid thinking about what's essential, as Pascal calls it. This busyness is our way of escaping metaphysical questioning and forgetting what we are, forgetting that we're mortal beings approaching our death every single day. Notice how some people are allergic to silence, as if silence is painful for them. They always have the urge to fill the void by doing something like moving, singing, or whistling. These people try to avoid silence at all costs because this emptiness reminds them of the emptiness of their own death. We instinctively seek to combat this sense of emptiness and escape nothingness. And the only way to do so is by keeping ourselves occupied and distracted. This happens through activities such as working, painting, watching TV, doing sports, or socializing. Since we discussed leisure activities in the previous video, now let's focus on work, particularly because it has a profound connection to our fear of death. Working is a successful mental occupation that is capable of completely occupying our minds and that's why some people can get addicted to work. Work serves as a distraction but also makes us feel useful. When we contribute to something outside of ourselves, we can alleviate our anxiety about death because we're focused on the task at hand. We don't have the time to think about anything else. However, when we're not useful, it reminds us that one day we will be dead and forgotten, which is something we want to avoid. The need to occupy our minds is both human and healthy. Some people work, others indulge in pleasures, and some may even create imaginary problems in their minds. The key is to be aware that you're diverting your attention and to consciously choose how you do so. Not all diversions are equal. Some can improve your life and enrich your soul, while others can worsen your existential anxiety and cause depression. So choose wisely. Work is crucial for alleviating our death anxiety anxiety, and this relationship is perfectly explained in Ernest Becker's book, The Denial of Death. It is an incredible work of psychology that explores how the concept of death influences our behavior. Becker argues that death is a fundamental aspect of human existence and a major source of anxiety for many people. As Heidegger and many others say, ancient cultures and civilizations coped with this anxiety by offering people ways to identify with higher realities such as God or gods, an afterlife, or unity with the cosmos through shared rituals and beliefs. 
beliefs. This is what Becker calls mythical heroism. Since this isn't the case anymore, we tend to look for other ways to soothe our death anxiety. Two ways are offered to us, either the path of personal heroism or the path of societal heroism. Both approaches aim to give meaning to our existence in order to ease the fear of death. Personal heroism involves channeling all our energy into following our calling and creating something that transcends societal norms. This project reassures us that we will spiritually outlive our physical bodies. It could be a work of art, an entrepreneurial venture or an academic pursuit. Whatever it is, it must come from within and be chosen by us, not dictated by society. In contrast, societal heroism involves fulfilling predetermined roles and gaining recognition within the framework of societal and cultural norms. Examples include being a banker, a democrat or a doctor. By engaging in something bigger and more meaningful than ourselves, we can transcend our mortality. This is why Becker calls them immortality projects. Also, some people achieve a sense of immortality by having children, as they outlive us and carry on our values and family lines. This can provide meaning by focusing on something that will likely endure beyond our own lives and is also more important than us. Regardless of the project we choose, the goal is always the same, to reassure us and distract us from our mortality. Being deeply engaged in something we consider important gives meaning to our lives and helps push thoughts of our mortality in the background. If we don't have any of these projects, the idea of death would invite itself into our lives and thinking about it can be the most painful and dreadful experience. That is why we like noise and activity so much. That is why imprisonment is such a horrific punishment. That is why the pleasure of being alone is incomprehensible. That is in fact the main joy of the condition of kingship, because people are constantly trying to amuse kings and provide them with all sorts of distraction. The king is surrounded by people whose only thought is to entertain him and prevent him from thinking about himself. King though he may be, he's unhappy if he thinks about it. Pascal emphasizes that even kings need to be entertained, which means that power, wealth and status can't protect us from the anxiety of death. We're all human and face death equally, regardless of our circumstances. If even kings are not exempt from this anxiety, who is? Only those who avoid such questions. People who go through life on autopilot and live like robots. They don't allow space for questioning and they find happiness in constant busyness. They're surviving, not truly living. Pascal recognized that confronting our mortality and seeking meaning in the face of death is a difficult task, but it's also what makes us great. It sets us apart from other beings and gives life its value. By accepting and preparing for death, we ultimately live a more unique and authentic experience. This is what makes us a privileged species. We're capable of conceiving time and projecting ourselves into the future. We're capable of surpassing ourselves and transcending our condition. The solution isn't to simply live like a robot and constantly divert our attention, but the exact opposite. To use death as the driving force of our existence. To use death as the source of life's meaning. As the Stoics wisely said, memento mori, remember you must die. This serves as a powerful reminder that time is limited and life shouldn't be wasted. Memento mori encourages us to focus on what we can control, the quality of our lives, not their length. So when you think of death, instead of diverting your attention, remember that the best antidote to our mortality is to live, to make sure you seize each day and live with purpose and intention. This is how you create a beautiful story at the end. Death twitches my ear. Live, he says. I'm coming. Thank you for watching.